Testing, testing. Testing, yes, this is, yep, that's on. I'm going to check the, uh, lec uh, the lectern. Testing, yes, that is on. And, uh, Parker, I think you need to turn up the uh, wireless too. Can you do that? You might, you might have to go back to that, you know, whenever we do the, uh, whenever you turn that mic on. Uh, testing, yes, that's very good. Maybe down just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. 
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together, the collect for the day found on your green sheet. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Here at Christ Church, I'm Nick Morris Clement, the pastor here. And thank you for being here to pray and sing in this holy place. Whether in the pew or on your couch, we are gathered as the one body of Christ. All that we need for worship this morning is guided by our worship bulletin and the green sheet, uh, which contains our prayers and readings and hymns. Uh, this morning we are using the green hymnal which is found on the end of your pews for the hymn before the gospel. So otherwise the hymns are found in your inserts. And I invite everyone to participate fully. I invite us now to be open to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us in the words of scripture. Again, welcome. <coughs> A reading from the prophet Habakkuk. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision 
make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We will pray the psalm responsibly, breaking at the asterisk. You are righteous, O Lord. And not right are your judgments. You have issued your decrees. With justice and in perfect faithfulness. My indig- indignation has consumed me. Because of my enemies forget your words. Your word has been tested to the uttermost. And your servant holds in your ear. I am small and of little account. Yet I have not come. Your justice is an everlasting justice. And your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me. Yet your commandments are my life. The righteousness of your decrees is everlasting. A reading from the second letter to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. To this end, we always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there named Zacchaeus was there. He was chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So, Friday and Saturday of this week just passed, the 237th, 237th Diocesan Convention of the Diocese of Massachusetts took place in Danvers. 237 times. I have trouble wrapping my head around that. Anyway, it was the first on-site convention since 2019. So we haven't been gathered as bodies together in the same room in three years, and the place was absolutely packed. I was a little surprised, actually, how packed it was, and we were all, you know, masked to the nines. Um, but nonetheless, <clears throat> worship was joyful. We sang songs and we prayed in Kikuyu, which is an African language in Spanish, as well as in English. We prayed in Portuguese, we prayed in Haitian Creole. <clears throat> Bishop Gates gave his address on the theme of the convention, which was the call of love in this time and place. The call of love in this time and place. His sermon was funny and erudite, as they often are, as well as powerful and fervent on the work that the church must continue to do to answer the call of love in this time and place, particularly with regard to racial justice. And much of the legislative work of the day was an attempt to put teeth into that work. As Cornell West once said, justice is what love looks like in public. So we're working as a church to love publicly. For me, one of the most memorable uh, moments of the convention was hearing from a fellow priest speaking to the whole convention who described an experience he had had the previous day as he walked into the Hilton Doubletree Hotel in Danvers. My colleague, I'll call him Bob, happens to be a black man. He is also a chaplain 
in the United States Army. He's a minister for multi-faith programs at an area college, and he's the bridge priest at a small parish on the North Shore. And Bob started his story, and he told us that as he entered the hotel on Friday when he was checking in, he was dressed in his full clerical garb. Now, that's the churchy term for white collar, black shirt, black pants, black shoes. So he's dressed as a priest. And yet someone stopped him and said, do you work here? Bob noted to us in the audience, as we listened to his story, I was dressed like this, white collar, black shirt, black pants, black shoes. And he gestured. Bob continued his story. He proceeded to the front desk to check in when a person cut in front of him, perfunctorily saying, is it okay if I cut in in front of you? Before doing just that. Bob reminded us that he was a black man dressed as a priest, white collar, black shirt, black pants, black shoes. Bob continued his story. Another one of our colleagues had witnessed this exchange, shared a knowing glance, and shook her head, indicating that what she had just seen had in fact happened, and it was not okay. Bob shared with us just how often he experiences slights like these, repeated acts of disrespect over the course of his life, experiences often endured by people of color in spaces that are primarily white. He also noted how encouraging, how life-giving it was that not only had our colleague seen what had happened, she had confirmed non-verbally, that he had been, in fact, disrespected. And her seeing confirmed his being. He felt seen and valued for who he was. Our gospel lesson this morning is about being seen I'm calling it this morning, I'm calling it the gaze of God. When Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, something amazing happens. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It's chapter 19. He's been on his way since chapter 9. He's very busy along the way, lots of healing, lots of storytelling. We've heard in the past few weeks the parable of the persistent widow, the parable of the dishonest manager, the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. We've learned about his healing of the ten lepers and so forth. Lots and lots and lots going on, but he's never too busy to see what is right in front of him, or in this case, what is right above him. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector based in Jericho. Now I should say parenthetically, the tree where Zacchaeus supposedly climbed up to watch down, it's still there in Jericho in front of a, um, in front of a storefront. We didn't stop. The bus didn't stop. The, the, the program director just kind of pointed over there and said, that's, that's where we think Zacchaeus did his thing. And then we just kind of kept on going. Anyway, the sycamore tree. The crowd sees Zacchaeus also. But they don't see who Jesus sees. The crowd engages in what Father Richard Rohr, Franciscan priest, whose uh, material I read quite a bit, what Richard Rohr calls the first gaze. The first gaze. The first gaze, our first look, is often clouded by stereotypes, by assumptions, by prejudices. It is often critical, demanding, often judgmental. It, it only sees the surface of a person and evaluates her primarily on what can she do for me? How can she make me feel or validate me or somehow? This is the first 
gaze. And to be sure, in this context, tax collectors, especially chief tax collectors in Jesus' day, they had a reputation for a reason. They collected taxes for the Roman Empire, the occupying power. And they hired underlings to help with that. Taxes consisted of duties levied on goods and services, but also on tolls, on the movement of goods and services across various demarcations. Contrary to popular lore, however, based on some research I've done, most were not rich, although some were, like Zacchaeus. Many, maybe even most, were likely trying hard to be honest, just to do their jobs in an un- fortunate situation. Really poor people probably had nothing against tax collectors because they were too poor to be taxed. Literate people, so like tradesmen, uh, merchants and the like, they were more likely to have run-ins with the tax man. And it was literate, wealthier people who actually wrote the gospel. So we need to keep that bias in mind to give Zacchaeus a little bit of a break from our 21st century perspective. Nonetheless, the crowd in Jesus' time in this setting does not see the whole Zacchaeus. They see only his role and make assumptions about his cleanliness, his character, his suitability to be with Jesus. So this is the first gaze that the crowd trains on Zacchaeus. Jesus exercises what Rohr calls the second gaze, the second gaze. He sees with the eyes of compassion, without ego, without judgment, without stereotyping, with no need to like get something from Zacchaeus. In fact, in fact he invites himself to dinner or to stay, right, which was, by our lights, a kind of a forward thing to do. But it indicated just how okay he was with Zacchaeus, all of Zacchaeus, his good parts, his bad parts. The crowd only saw the impure parts. But Jesus, with the second gaze, the compassionate gaze, sees the whole Zacchaeus, and desires to be with him. Now, here's where I think things get really interesting, especially if you're interested in grammar. I think it's more interesting than just grammar, but hear me out here. And it has to do with the grammar of the Greek beneath the English that we hear this morning. The English that we hear today has Zacchaeus saying, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. That's what our English says this morning. But the Greek, so I'm told, is actually in the present tense. So if we read it in the present tense in English, or one of the ways of reading it in the present tense, it says, I am giving half of my possessions to the poor. Those whom I defraud, I do, am, paying back four times as much. So one way of translating the Greek suggests that Zacchaeus, after being seen by the second gaze of Jesus, has a kind of conversion. After being seen and known and invited to be a host, he will repent of his former bad behavior and start doing the right thing. The other way of translating the Greek suggests that no one really knew the real Zacchaeus, compassionate, just, until the gaze of Jesus called it forth. And the crowd, however, still stuck in that first gaze, stuck in the stereotyping of a person like Zacchaeus, didn't believe it. And they're upset when Jesus says, I'm going to eat and stay with this man. In either case, it is the second gaze of Jesus that brings forth life from Zacchaeus in the face of a judgmental, superficial crowd. Jesus restores Zacchaeus 
to the fullness of community, which in Jesus' time, in Jesus' context, to call someone a son of Abraham or a daughter of Abraham, you are in the fold. Jesus restores Zacchaeus to the community. Friends, the gaze of God that Jesus has for Zacchaeus is the gaze of God that Jesus has for us, for each one of us. That second gaze. Our culture is often blinded by the first gaze. We swim in the water of the first gaze, do we not? The superficial snap judgment critical, what's in it for me, how do you threaten me, how do you help me, or my people, or my tribe. But God sees with the second gaze, with the eyes of love and compassion, and the whole, all of us, every bit of us, that's what God sees. That's what God loves. That's what God values. That's what God yearns to bring back to God and to one another. Now that is hard work. It takes practice. None of us gets it perfectly. And yet, I believe that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus, is to practice that second gaze on our fellow humans, even on our created world, not as instruments to be used, but as living beings to be loved and brought in to the community. As we bask in that gaze that God has for us, so can we continue, so may we continue to practice the second gaze on all whom we meet, to see one another as we truly are, beloved children of God. That's what our sibling Bob needed to experience at that desk at the Hilton. That's what our sister was able to give him. May we do that over and over and over and over again to see who's right in front of us the way that God sees us and sees them. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and join your voice with the voice of the church throughout the ages in the Nicene Creed found on page four in our worship bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshipped and glorified. She has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people begin on page five of your bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's love is everlasting. Come, let us praise our God with joy. Let us come before our God with thanksgiving. For the good world, for things great and small, beautiful and awesome, for seen and unseen splendors. Grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For human life, for talking and moving and thinking together, for common hopes and hardships shared from birth until our dying. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For work to do and strength to work, for the comradeship of labor, for exchanges of good humor and encouragement. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For marriage, for the mystery and joy of flesh made one, for mutual forgiveness and burden shared, for secrets kept in love. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For constellations of fellowship, for the freedom to serve and the graces of friendship. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For families of all kinds and configurations, for living together and eating together, for family amusements and family pleasures. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For children, for their energy and curiosity, for their brave play and startling frankness, for their sudden sympathies, with grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For the young, for their high hopes, for their irreverence toward worn out values, for their search for freedom, for their solemn vows. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For growing up and growing old, for wisdom deepened by experience, for rest and leisure, and for time made precious by its passing. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For your help in times of doubt and sorrow, for healing our diseases, for preserving us in temptation and danger, for the grace to serve others in love and justice. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For the church into which we have been called, for the good news we receive by word and sacrament, for our life together in Christ. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. For your Holy Spirit, who guides our steps and brings us gifts of faith and love, who prays in us and prompts our grateful worship. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. Above all, O God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation, for our hope in him and his love for us. With grateful hearts, we thank you, O God. Give thanks to the Lord, who is good. God's love is everlasting. The altar flowers are given today in memory of Angus and Eugene Van Osdall Swift. Are there others to remember this morning? Most magnificent God, who fashioned all things from nothing, and who blesses the creation with light and life. We praise you with grateful hearts and outstretched hands. May our hands bear gifts for the building up of your kingdom and the healing of the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you 
opposing your will in our lives, we have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace, remembering to give peace to those who are at home. Peace. Please be seated. So good morning again. I invite uh, you to peruse the sheet of uh, announcements um, in your worship bulletin or on the click-throughs if you're online. Those of you who are here on site, please join us for coffee hour in the upper parish hall and please pick up a name tag if you don't have one already. If you don't have one, just make one for yourself and so we can give one another the gift of hospitality. In particular, uh, today we honor Charles Raines on his last day with us as he begins his retirement. So come have some cake um, and have some fellowship with Charles before he goes. Uh, we are uh, still in the midst of our annual appeal, and we've uh, been blessed to have the last few Sundays have members of our congregation talk about how outreach has been an extension of our grateful hearts. And today we have Jean McCarthy, one of our uh, uh, appeal co-chairs will share kind of a wrap-up of, uh, of some of her thoughts about our, um, our calling uh, with grateful hearts, how we reach out uh, as well as reach in as a congregation. So thank you, Jean. As, as she makes her way forward, I can report that as of Friday, we have 44 households who have sent in financial intentions worth a total of $173,000, which is fantastic progress. Um, and thank you if you've already uh, participated. If you haven't yet, uh, there is still time, and I invite you to express uh, your grateful heart in this way. Hello. Bear with me. I'm co-chair with Kim Rocco of the Stewardship Committee. Uh, stewardship, uh, you know that word. It was once called pledging. Last year we called it estimate of giving. This year uh, I refer to it as financial intention. Uh, some schools call it annual fund and so forth. Whatever we call it, everybody gives. The question is, of course, how much and when. While we are this year sharing with a grateful heart, we have been acknowledging outreach. Kim said it well in her introduction on October 2nd. Barbara Hurley spoke of manna. So many of you in the past have bought bananas, made peanut butter sandwiches and salads, built casseroles, driven, served, provided food and company to folks in Boston. Cecile Leroy explained another week our dedication to the parish at St. Luke's in Haiti. In the past, we've sent food, musical instruments, we've bought goats, and provided medical attention. Joanna Neal with Christina Ruddy applauded these examples of outrage and talked about the Community Concerns Group, which helps folks in nearby neighborhoods. Three Sundays of outreach, caring and sharing as Jesus teaches. Today, I wish to add examples of caring a little closer to home. We care for others, and we care for each other. 
For example, the knitting ministry, prayer shawls, baby caps, get well miniatures. Here, a small group gather monthly and produce items for the ill, the bereaved, the newborn. They are reaching out. The confirmants, while learning about their church, these young people experience problems of the inner city and learn of possible solutions through participation in a group called City Reach, which is based at our cathedral. They are reaching out. Here in our parish hall, the holy folders meet weekly to fold the church bulletins and sometimes stuff envelopes. Also on campus, we have Bible study, meeting both Wednesday morning and evening and led by a gifted teacher, Tracy Rubin, who many of you know. Almost 30 souls are studying the Acts of the Apostles this year. Last year, we looked at Genesis. Most, most members are parishioners, but others bring views of the Greek Orthodox Roman Catholic and Jewish traditions. Whether at Bible study or knitting ministry or manna or community concerns, so many of us are involved in the work of the church community. Dare I say each of us, perhaps each of us is involved. I can say that we all help financially as we're able. Everyone contributes. Well, it is that time of year. The rector and the vestry are devising the budget. There's much to consider. The structure, the staffs, the services, the support, the roof, the boiler, the paper towels, the chancel, the nave, the offices, the memorial room, the cleaning closets, the restrooms, and of course, the clergy administrators, the caretakers, and the choir. A postscript, if I may. I ask you to consider our music. The choir does welcome new members, and the section leaders could lead, use a raise after a decade at the same level. Today, we lose a superb mus musician and organist, Charles Rains. We have hired an, an interim organist as we search for a permanent organist and music director. It is that time of year. Please share, share with a grateful heart. Thank you, Jean. Next Sunday, we'll uh, be con concluding the public part of the campaign with uh, an in-gathering um, as part of our liturgy. Can you guys see these little heart things? So each of you will get, when you come in next Sunday, a little heart, and you, you could have more than one if you want. Um, and we will invite you to write inside this little heart something that you're grateful for. It can have a direct connection with the church, but there's so much to be grateful for. We don't need to limit ourselves to what we're grateful about this community. Something that you're grateful for. And you'll put that in the plate when it goes by. And then we'll put it in the upper parish hall on a board where we can see all the different things that we're grateful for. If you're not gonna be able to be here next Sunday, we invite you to call or email the office, tell us what you'd like to have in one of these hearts, and we'll write it for you and put it uh, on display in the upper parish hall. So we invite you to be present next Sunday um, as we uh, include the public part. If we haven't heard from you, um, you will be hearing from uh, a member of the stewardship team just to make sure that you've had a chance um, to contribute to this year's annual appeal. So we haven't forgotten you. Speaking of next Sunday, fall back, spring forward.
fall back, spring forward. So time change next week. We want to make sure that we're all here at the same time. Ascribe to God the honor due unto the divine name. Bring offerings and come into the courts of the Holy One.
I invite you to stand as you're able as we continue with the great thanksgiving found on page 7 in your worship bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away, and yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine, in ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth, and make us your new creation, the body of Christ, given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died and lives for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. All are invited to this table for Christ's refreshment.
pray together on page 11. After a solo. Let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the one holy and undivided Trinity, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on the white sheet. Lord, you give the great commission.